your cell phones and please rise for the opening prayer. <laughs> the voice of God calls to us to awaken in him. How will he find us when he comes? Awake and ready. And when he asks us to dedicate ourselves ever more perfectly to him, how will he find us? Awake and ready. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Divine Mother. Divine Mother. Friend, beloved God. Friend, beloved God. Great Masters of Self-Realization. Great Masters of Self-Realization. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Babaji Krishna. Babaji Krishna. Lahiri Mahashaya. Lahiri Mahashaya. Swami Sri Yukteswar. Swami Sri Yukteswar. And Paramhansa Yogananda. And Paramhansa Yogananda. Saints of all religions. Saints of all religions. Humbly we bow to you all. Humbly we bow to you all. Beloved Lord. Beloved Lord. Like rivers running to the sea. Like rivers running to the sea. Our souls are attracted to thee. Our souls are attracted to thee. Bless us and guide us. Bless us and guide us. Help us to make haste. Help us to make haste to come home to thee. To come home to thee. To thy bliss. To thy bliss. To thy love. <laughs> to thy love. Oh, oh peace. Peace. Amen. Amen. We'll have our choir come up.
give you an opportunity to sing with us as a chant. Our first chant is on page 23, St. Teresa of Avila's admonition. Sunday school, and we'll sing When I Awake, which is on page 26 in your chant. Bye. 
Concentrating at the spiritual eye, communing with the light there, commanding our bodies to be still, we'll meditate for just a few minutes. maintaining a meditative state, let's listen to the words on this week's quality of practicality <clears throat> from Affirmations for Self-Healing by Swami Kriyananda. Many spiritual seekers and others with high ideals lose sight of the need to make their idealism practical. Many even resent the suggestion that they try to put an ideal into practice as though the very effort to do so would mean somehow lessening its purity. But God is no idle dreamer. Were the universe not kept in a state of perfect balance, chaos, not harmony, would be the common state. We, too, should be practical in our idealism. Life, to be ever expansive, must be a search for truth. Will it work is the preliminary question to is it true? The test of an ideal is whether it is practical or not. By practicality, we mature from the state of idle dreaming to become emissaries of the truth. And now, concentrating at the spiritual eye, let's affirm together, though my spirit soars in the skies of consciousness, 
Though my spirit soars in the skies of consciousness, my feet and hands labor here on earth. My feet and hands labor here on earth to make truth real to all. To make truth real to all. Though my spirit soars in the skies of consciousness, Though my spirit soars in the skies of consciousness. My feet and hands labor here on earth. My feet and hands labor here on earth. To make truth real to all. To make truth real to all. Though my spirit soars in the skies of consciousness. Though my spirit soars in the skies of consciousness. My feet and hands labor here on earth. My feet and hands labor here on earth. To make truth real to all. And now mentally only, but still with deep concentration, though my spirit soars in the skies of consciousness, my feet and hands labor here on earth to make truth real to all. And mentally pray with me, let not my thoughts lift me up through beautiful clouds of imagined possibilities unless you give me the power also to materialize my dreams. We'll have our reading now. Today's reading is from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. <clears throat> Living in the presence of God. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, we read a king capitalized for the references to God who welcomes certain devotees to the divine consciousness, saying, I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. The elect asked him when it was they had served him in these ways, and the king answered, Verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. To seek God as residing in every human being, as he indeed does, is to open oneself to limitless opportunities for serving him. Paramahansa Yogananda in Autobiography of a Yogi described a saint who lived in this consciousness as the greatest man of humility I ever knew. He described a seemingly chance encounter with this saint. Another day found me walking alone near the Howrah rail Railroad Station. I stood for a moment by a temple, silently criticizing a small group of men with a drum and cymbals who were violently reciting a chant. How undevotionally they use the Lord's divine name in mechanical repetition, I reflected. My gaze was astonished by the rapid approach of Master Mahasaya. Sir, how come you are here? The saint, ignoring my question, answered my thought. Isn't it true, little sir, that the beloved's name sounds sweet from all lips, ignorant and wise? He passed his arm around me affectionately. I found myself carried on his magic carpet of merciful to the merciful presence. <clears throat> if you would see God, watch for him everywhere. If you would hear his voice, Listen for it in all sounds, and also in their supporting silences. If you would know God, seek his wisdom behind merely human knowledge. The Bhagavad Gita, in the sixth chapter, states, One who beholds my presence everywhere, and all things dwelling equally in me, he never loses, loses loving sight of me, nor I of him through all eternity. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh.
in winding. I wanted to start by just adding the next part of that stanza from the Bhagavad Gita reading, because it's so beautiful and I think it really speaks to all of us. That yogi finds security in me, who though his days be rushed and action filled, is anchored inwardly at rest in me, and worships me in every living form. That one, Arjuna, is the best of men and truest he of yogis, whose heart feels the joys of all, their pains, their searing griefs, with equal care as though they were his own. And when I think back into my life about um, being awakened to God's presence, because there was a time when I didn't believe in God, at least there was a portion of a few years of my 20s that that was true, and a friend had to drag me to my first Ananda uh, service because I told him, I don't do God. But when I got there, I saw Yogananda's picture on the altar. It was the picture of the last smile taken just before he made his conscious exit from the body. And his eyes seemed to be calling out to me. And there was a feeling as I walked through the door, I felt energy all over my whole body just pulsating. I didn't know about auras or anything like that in those days, but I'm sure my whole aura just lit up just by seeing his picture and being in the room where he was. And people, um, in order to learn how to feel God's presence, they have to open to God. And people's awareness of that flow of consciousness gets awakened in different ways. For me, it was seeing that picture of Yogananda and then seeing the love and the energy and the vitality and the radiance of the people from Ananda who were giving the service. I looked at Savitri Simpson, who was speaking that day, and I said, I don't know what that woman has, but that's what I want. <laughs> and what I realized was she was channeling God through her love and through her joy. And, um, but people like, I was thinking of others, George Washington Carver, who was a very wonderful botanist and did all kinds of things to help um, the black people recover uh, from a very hard time and to help agriculture move forward. He felt God's presence mostly in the early morning hours, especially when he was out in nature and when he was working with plants and out in his garden. And he could speak to God then. And he always said, if you love something enough, it will speak to you. And of course, in the yogic teachings, love is just another name for God. And also, someone like Albert Schweitzer, who spent a good portion of his life in Africa, far away from uh, Europe and his family, and in a lot of uh, situations that were very difficult. But he had an awakening when he was a young man, and he was in Europe. And he made a pact with God, whom he believed in, from a very early age. He said, I'm going to live the first 30 years of my life as I want to. And then the rest of my life I'm giving to you and to the service of mankind. And he kept that promise. He was a wonderful scholar, learned a lot about music. He had many, many beautiful talents that he shared with others. But his, he had a very, um, very deep awakening experience in Africa one day when he was sort of depressed, he was sitting by the water and he watched the river flowing by him. And as he was sitting there, he was breathing and he felt all of the life around him, the trees and everything. And he said he then opened up to the fact that all life you had to have reverence for. And that was when he had a very deep awakening also. Jane Goodall, who I've spoken of before, she spent a lot of time out in nature by herself with the gorillas. And she had a different um, awakening. She actually didn't think for a good portion of her life that she believed in God. But she had the ability to concentrate and to feel things and to want to know. She had a real thirst, first for knowledge and later for truth. As a, as a little five-year-old, she ran away from her mother, who was quite protective of her, because she was wondering how chickens laid eggs. And she sat in the chicken coop with the egg, with the, underneath where the chickens would lay the eggs for five hours, 
waiting for the chicken to lay the egg so she could see how it happened. Now that's from a five-year-old, so she had great concentration. <laughs> and later when she was out in nature and doing the work that she felt inspired to do, she admitted that she felt this flow that Schweitzer was talking about and George Washington Carver was talking about. And then someone who was uh, right around the time that I went to that um, meeting with Yogananda and the Ananda group, I saw a movie by a wonderful uh, saint, Mother Teresa, and it was about her life. And I'll never forget that movie because it had such a powerful impact on me. I was praying about whether I should move to Ananda Village or not. And I saw this movie and it decided me to do it because, you know, she had her awakening experience as a young nun. And of course, she, all, she felt a deep love for God because she became a nun. But the awakening to what her job would be and how she would serve God and serve God and others came as she was riding on a train in India and she was riding on this really windy train ride and she said she just felt Jesus come to her and tell her that she needed to minister to the poorest of the poor and she said you know she not only felt that but she when she was awakened like that she actually had enough courage to leave the security of the monastery that she was at and go out and be the one that would pick up that first person on the street to take care of them, the poorest of the poor. But she didn't see them as that. She said, I saw Jesus in everyone. And it was Jesus that gave her that strength to act on um, ministering to them. And she said in that film, they, over and over and over again in different ways, that it's very important for each one of us to put our love into action. And of course, love means God. So if we want to serve God, we need to have that love in our hearts. And then we need to find some way in our lives to put it into action. Some of us can do that in our work. Others do that through our family. But whatever we want to do, if we want to tune in to the highest part of being in the presence of God and feeling that presence with us, it has to keep expanding. We can't keep it just for ourselves. We can't keep it just for our little family, although those are important things to take care of ourselves and to love our family. It's even more important to start expanding and feeling ourselves loving God in all and feeling that love flowing through us in some way. And Swami Kriyananda, too, as a young man, he must have had really strong Indian samskars um, memories of being in India because he became really awakened to God's presence. He said he grew up, I think it was Episcopalian. And, but that religion, he said the way it was presented to him, he couldn't connect with it. It just didn't resonate in his heart. He didn't feel that much was happening with that. But then through a series of events that you can read about in his book and some of you have heard about, he came onto the autobiography of a yogi with Yogananda's picture on the front of that cover. And those eyes spoke to him as well, just like they did to me later. And he left his life that he was, had planned for himself and got on the bus and came and became Yogananda's disciple. And he became someone who founded Ananda and he touched many of our lives and is still touching our lives with how he told us to have courage and to believe and to have faith in God, but to have faith that was built on experience. He said, it's, belief is good. You have to start from somewhere. But if you really want to build faith in your life and be able to feel God with you, you have to feel that presence in some real way. Just like, you know, when I saw that picture, I had a, a feeling. And he talked a lot towards the end of his life. Um, I happened to watch the satsang that he gave in Pune, India. Many of us in this room were there. Uh, it, he gave this talk uh, just four weeks or so before he passed away. And it's a very powerful talk. And he was talking in there about how reason won't lead you to God. You can't draw God's presence only through reason. That it comes through feeling. 
that you have to have your heart awakened and opened for that flow to really come through you and to feel you. And he talked about many other things. I would really love you to hear that talk. Anybody that emails me, I'll send you the link so you can listen to it. But another thing that he said that was very powerful because there was a question there, and this has to do with believing in God. There was a young man, and he asked, it was the last question of the satsang. And he said, what if you have moments of faith and experience, but then at other times you don't even know if you believe in God or not? What, you, what should you do? And Swami said, go with the faith. And everybody just sort of laughed. And then he said, but provisionally, he said, test God. He said, test it in your own life. He said, see if you don't feel happier when you turn towards God. And that you don't feel less happy when you turn away. And that's another thing that Yogananda said. He said that we had the ability to do two things. Move toward God or move away from God. That's how much free will we have. And I thought about my friend. I'm wearing her mala that she gave me when she passed away. Her name was Happy Winningham. And we were kind of buddies from the very first time we met each other at Ananda in the early days that we both had come there. Um, we both were um, pretty outward rajasic people, liked people, noisy. <laughs> <laughs> and we loved to dance and sing. And she had been an actress, uh, sort of on Broadway and off Broadway, and a dancer. So we had all these connections. But then we both really loved God, too. And so um, I was at that time fighting cancer, and she actually was uh, infected with the HIV virus. You know, it was interesting because, I just want to say this, because this was the wisdom of Swami Kriyananda. This was years ago now, over 20-some years ago, when people felt if you had that virus, you were dead, basically. That was the hypnosis around it. And she went to see Swamiji when she found out that she had this disease. And he looked at her and he said, OK. He said, I want you to energize twice a day. And he says, and I want you to meditate deeply, as deeply as you can, at least twice a day. And then the third thing he said was, don't buy into the hypnotism around this disease. And she took him, his advice to heart. And she meditated very, very deeply for years. She lived for lots of years after this situation came to be known. In that time, she had times when she would be really ill. But during that whole time, she would always try to do her best to think of God. And one of the ways she drew God into her consciousness was she said, I have to find an affirmation that's really short because that's all my brain can remember. And so she chose, Father, thou art in me, I am well. And that became her mantra. As soon as she was going to sleep, she would say, Father, thou art in me, I am well. Father, thou art in me, I am well. When she would wake up, Father, thou art in me, I am well. Father, thou art in me, I am well. And then she would also try as much as she could through the day to have that mantra too, so that when, like we're told, if you keep your mind on God, and a God-reminding activity. When you go to meditate, you'll meditate more deeply. And so she started meditating three hours a day, and she used this mala to do that. So when she died, she left me this mala, and I've taken it to India with me, and whenever I need to just feel close to her or feel close to God, I can feel that vibration that she put here in that mala. And you know, she had a very powerful experience too when she was awakened. Because she had a life that was pretty worldly before she moved to Ananda, filled with love and joy, but still very worldly. But what happened to her and, uh, was she was in an automobile accident. And when she was in that accident, she was hurt very badly. And um, she ended up leave, you know, having to have an operation, which they took half of her spleen away and different things. But the important thing was, while she was ill, and while they were waiting for the people to come and take care of her and take her to the hospital, she had an out-of-body experience. And during that out-of-body experience, she saw this kind of medium-tall brown man in an orange turban and an orange robe 
come towards her. And she was enjoying being out of her body, and I think she was ready to go. Her soul was in some ways ready to go. And this being, that of course is Yogananda, took out a flashlight and he just shined the light on her and he just went, no, and he beckoned her to come back. So she came back and then of course she had to go through lots of things that she had to go through. And just to finish that karma because it was very interesting about the fact that she had lost her spleen. Because when the final uh, time came when she was getting ready to leave her body, the night, the very night before this whole scenario started, we were invited to her house. And she was radiant with God's presence. She had been working on her book that she'd been working on. She was sharing with us the classes that she was teaching for young people. She was so happy to be in her life and doing what she was doing. And then the very next day, they, she was in a helicopter and they were flying her to Sacramento in this what would turn out to be a few days later, the passing of her, her, her physical body. But another interesting thing was it wasn't really the HIV that took her. The doctor that waited on her, he said, if she'd had her spleen, she probably could have made it through this. So you just never know what's going to happen. But she was radiant with God's presence just before she left. Just like Swamiji was radiant with God's presence at that satsang just a few weeks before. And he was able to say many things to many people. He answered many questions that I, I feel like his soul was wanting us to know the answers to those questions. Somehow he must have known on some level that he would be going. And he was acting from that presence within. So, um, I also wanted to share just a little bit because Swamiji talked on that talk. He said about how important it was for him and how much he felt because he was in the room at the Biltmore Hotel when um, Master left his body. And he felt um, that energy. Of, it was a great sadness for him, but he also felt, you know, he. He felt empowered by the time that he'd had with Yogananda. And he put that power that he felt from God's consciousness that he got through the guru and through his own. I mean, he meditated long hours, too, so that he would have the strength and the courage to do the work that Master told him. He, had, he said, you have a great work to do, Walter. That's what he called him. And he took strength from his guru and from the times that he practiced the teachings that his guru told him to do. And that's um, something that we all can remember because even though Yogananda left his body there in the Biltmore Hotel, we can still go there. In fact, Om Prakash and I went there at one time when we were down helping the new Los Angeles Center get started years ago. We went there and they still have, they have, even though they've remodeled the room where Yogananda left his body, they kept the part the, the, near the fountain and stuff where he was standing when he left his body. And when we were there, I just went right over that place and stood there. And I'll tell you, the energy there is palpable. I felt it move up my spine just like it was an electric charge. And I felt this bliss and this peace come over me that lasted a long time. And sometimes I can even feel it again. So that energy of the master is there in that room. And I thought about, too, about Swami Kriyananda leaving his body in Italy and the pilgrims that came back from there when they went to his room. They felt that energy flowing through them, too. So that life force, that radiance that comes from God's presence through these kinds of great souls and through you and me. It's timeless. We can feel it. We can be awakened to it. And then it can flow through our lives and help us to awaken for our own good, for our own soul's good. But then to keep our awakening expanding out so that we find ways to serve others, so that that energy will keep going round and keep moving outward and to uh, bless many, many souls 
from the radiance that we can draw ourselves from our spiritual life. I'd like to read this part of Whispers from Eternity by Yogananda. Teach me, Christ-like, by the power of concentration to still the restless storms of desire raging on the lake of my mind. Stilling those waters, I lovingly behold thy unruffled face of cosmic stillness. Cause the little wave of my life to subside that thy consciousness in me spread out to become thine own vastness. Let me feel my heart throbbing in thy breast, my feet moving with thy energy, my, thy breath breathing through mine, thy energy actively moving my arms, thy thoughts weaving all the thoughts in my brain. When I cry, thy soft sigh within me wakens me to thy joy. In thy playfulness, little bubble visions of thy creation float dancingly in the chamber of my dreams, which manifest my sleep of delusion. Thy meteoric will courses through the skies of my own will power. Make me feel that it is thy, thou who art I. Oh, make me thyself, that I behold my little bubble of self ever floating in thee. We'll give you an opportunity now to make an offering. Please take what you'd like to give, place it in your right hand, and let us pray together. Divine Mother, Divine. We offer to thee, to thee the fruit of our labors. We offer to thee the fruit of our labors. Bless this offering. Bless this offering. That it serve as a channel. That it serve as a channel. Of thy light to true to truth seekers everywhere. To truth seekers everywhere. Om, Om peace. peace. Amen. Amen. This is Swami Kriyananda's song about waking up. Kind of a fun one. Very fun. <laughs> Come chill and wake up. It's morning and the brother's son just shook his finger to, to tell you the new day's begun. Open your window and listen to the morning air for Melody, melody is everywhere Melody, melody is everywhere The world is waiting to tell you of a million things The shout of daybreak, the flutter of the robin's wings Come out and listen, there's magic for us all to share Sung your part. This world is temple, and morning is a time of prayer. Well, melody, melody is everywhere. Melody, melody is everywhere. We had to get a whistle in there somewhere. <laughs> As we get 
closer to Christmas, we head into a very inward time of the year. And we have um, some of our most inward events coming up. Next Saturday is our Christmas meditation retreat from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. here at the temple. The complete schedule of the day is available downstairs. And you can come for all or part of the day. But we encourage you to come for as much as you can because it's a very, very special time, special day. Then the next day, Sunday, next Sunday, we have our special Christmas family service here at the temple. So uh, this will be a fun time with all the children and a cast of thousands. So you don't want to miss that one. And then on Christmas Eve, we have our traditional candlelight service from 9 to 10. Again, a very beautiful uh, inward service. And then on Christmas Day, we have a special service here at noon. Um, again, with a, a cast of, oh, dozens, and um, more of an adult service will have Sunday school available for that service. And then, of course, our potluck at the community in Linwood uh, after the service on Christmas Day. And you can sign up downstairs for that and choose a menu item to bring. So, oh, and the All Sangha Christmas party is after service next Sunday. And you're all invited, of course, to that. And please let me know if you're coming if you haven't. <laughs> let Prim Shanti know everything that you're coming to and everything that you're not coming to. <laughs> Less phone calls. <laughs> so she doesn't have to make as many phone calls. So um, obviously getting ready for those days of inward uh, beautiful service, you'll want to get your Christmas shopping done today. So we have some opportunities for that too. There are uh, farm products, of course, downstairs that everybody enjoys. And we also have 20% off of Crystal Clarity products in the boutique right now. Um, we have East West is offering a 15% discount, special 15% discount for Sangha members. And do we have coupons for that today? Ask for a coupon at the <laughs> counter at East West. Um, the thrift store is having a special shopping event this afternoon. Um, what else do we have? Oh, Gifts of Spirit. If you, you can make a donation to the Fellowship Hall in the name of a friend or a loved one. And you can do that downstairs at the front desk. Then we also have um, a recipe book that's coming. You can buy in advance, prepay for a recipe, a Ananda cookbook for a friend. And this is a brand new project. It's so new that they're also asking for recipes. So uh, when you go out today, you, you'll be, get one of these, and it has all of the details. And then you know we have the um, retreat coming up, Retreat to the Heart of Silence, coming up in February. Uh, the deadline to sign up for that is January 18th, if you'd like to uh, do that for yourself. But it's also a great Christmas gift. So you can see that there are many opportunities to get all this Christmas shopping thing over with today, before you leave. Um, also, we have today, uh, right after or before you do your Christmas shopping, we have a healing prayer council meeting downstairs today with Christy. Okay. Did I forget anything? No. Okay. Actually, this is the time to sign up right away for next 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs> we have beautiful flower arrangements again this week, thanks. And we have also, it's wonderful, they have this beautiful tree. Thank you for all the be beautificationers. <laughs> and now we have the beautiful Festival of Lights. <laughs> Let us lift up our hearts in a Festival of Light. The essence of this ceremony has been passed down from ancient times. O oh, waves that we are on the bosom of the infinite sea, joyfully together let us celebrate our own greater reality. For now, by God's grace, our redemption is at hand. The promise has been given. The divine light returning anew to earth has given us power, as the Holy Bible proclaims, to become the sons of God. Into our hands have been delivered the sacred keys of awakening. Abundant now is our hope. The Lord, through the Bhagavad Gita, promised, even the worst of sinners, by steadfast meditation on me, speedily comes to me. 
Again, in that holy scripture, he declared, even a little practice of this inward religion will free one from dire fears and colossal sufferings. And whereas suffering and sorrow in the past were the coin of man's redemption, for us now the payment has been exchanged for calm acceptance and joy. Thus, may we understand that pain is the fruit of self-love, whereas joy is the fruit of love for God. From sun and moon and all the stars, from glistening seas, high mountains, desert solitudes, and vast fruitful plains, and from the hearts of mankind and of creatures everywhere, goes up in wordless yearning a prayer for redemption. Please stand and repeat after me. O oh, mighty source of all that is. O oh, mighty source of all that is. From sorrow lead us to everlasting joy. From sorrow lead us to everlasting joy. From darkness lead us to infinite light. From darkness lead us to infinite light. From death lead us to immortality. From death lead us to immortality. Oh, peace. peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A fledgling bird once flew out into the world. Gain strength and wisdom, its parents told it. And what you acquire, share with others, even as we have shared with you. For you are a part of all that is. Thus, Lord, we left you countless eons ago. Ours was a holy mission. You charged us to learn great lessons from life. To be fruitful in the gifts you had given us to expand and multiply them. Alas, we abandoned our mission. Instead, we hoarded selfishly. Nor did wisdom come to us when repeatedly we lost everything we had. For the young bird, in flight for the first time, gloried in its newfound strength. It began to think, how foolish I would be to share my strength with anyone. What else is wisdom? if not to keep what is mine for myself. And so we, like that bird, entered upon the second stage of the soul's long journey away from its home in God, the stage which is called the revolt. That bird's brief day was like eons of our time. When afternoon came, it entered a storm cloud and soon found itself struggling for its life. Wind and rain lashed at its wings. The more it fought back, the weaker it became. Give yourself into my hands, cried the wind. To your strength, I can then add my own. At last, the little bird heeded this counsel. Then suddenly, it found itself soaring joyously high above the clouds. Hours passed, and night fell. The little bird grew afraid. How, it cried. Can I fly in this darkness? And the night whispered, Fear not, for lo, peace awaits you in the unknown. Surrender to me, and your strength will be renewed. And after a time, the tiny rebel surrendered and found the night's counsel true. And rain and sky and grassy fields all sang, Behold, your very strength to fly has never been your own. Look to the source of all power if you would conquer fear and weakness. And the bird asked, Where can I find that source? And they answered, Seek it in the farthest depths of being, in your own self. Thus gradually, the bird entered that third stage of the journey, which is called the quest. We now, like that little bird, have come to realize that buffeting winds are life's way of giving us strength and courage. That even fear, like shadows on a statue, gives light and substance to hope. From the depths of unknowing, Lord, we cry out to thee. Is there no lasting purpose to our lives? Behold, all that we thought was light was but darkness. Who are we in reality? For what end were we made? Ever and again, through your awakened suns, the answer comes. The forming of stars and moons and planets, of galaxies revolving on the tides of space, of drifting continents, upheaving mountains, snowy wastes and dark 
silent ocean deeps, had but this for its design, the birth of life, and with life's birth, the dawn of self-awareness, passage through dim corridors of waking consciousness to emerge at last into infinite light, into perfect joy. O children of light, forsake the darkness. Please stand. Know that forever you and he are one. Raise your hands and chanting Om, ask that the power of God replenish you in body, mind, and soul. Oh. 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 seated. Such, O oh Lord, was your promise. Gaze upon this light as a symbol of God's love. A prayer of love went up from earth and you responded. A ray of your light flashed out from the heart of infinity, burst downward through night skies of consciousness and was born on earth for the redemption of mankind in human form. Many times has that light descended, drawn to earth by the call of aspiring love. Your chosen people have always been those of every race and nation who, with deep love, chose thee. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, with all my heart, with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my soul, and with all my strength, and with all my strength, I choose thy love. I choose thy love. I choose only thee. I choose only thee. The infinite Christ consciousness, the only begotten, has come down anew to earth for the salvation of mankind. When we need you, Lord, our beloved, you descend. Our human griefs your love alone can mend. By proud indifference unaffected, though eternally rejected, you remain our friend. Long we fear to face your love, lest our empty
high in the Himalaya, eyes filled with divine love, Jesus appeared to the great master, Babaji. The lights on the high altar of my church, he said, have been growing dim. Though still lit on lower altars of good works, the noble taper of inner communion with the Lord burns low and is ill attended. Let us together, united in Christ's love, set lights ablaze on that high altar once again. Thus a new ray of light was sent to earth through the great masters of this path. Greater can no love be than this, from a life of infinite joy and freedom in God, willingly to embrace limitation, pain, and death for the salvation of mankind. For such ever has been the sacrifice of the great masters for the world. Here then is the fourth and last stage of the soul's long journey through time and space, the redemption. Lord, we offer up the little light that is in us into thy blazing light of infinity. Grant us the grace to know thee and make us ever increasingly pure channels of thy love to all. the grace of God that has come anew to earth through our line of gurus, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Sri Yukteswar, and Paramahansa Yogananda. This grace is eternally channeled to mankind by great masters in every religion. It has been given new clothing by our gurus to reflect man's dawning awareness that matter is only a manifestation of divine energy. In God, all are equal, not only Jesus Christ, Lord Krishna, and great saints everywhere, but even in essence, those on earth who have sinned most gratefully. Joyfully lifting up our hearts in song, we pray that we, who earnestly seek communion with your light, receive it in our lives abundantly. of you who feel so inclined to come up to the altar and receive the touch of light from the masters. As you approach, offer a prayer of gratitude to the infinite Christ 
in whose love our line of gurus has descended, that we might all come to God. Pray, too, for the grace to share with all as you have received, for you are a part of all that is. May the light of Christ, the infinite consciousness, shine upon you. Just a moment of silence. Let's stand and share with all the world the blessings we've received. Sing out with joy all our nights and 
pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Divine Mother, Dearest Friend, Dearest Friend, Beloved, Beloved, God, God. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Sri Yukteswar, Paramhansa Yogananda. Great saints of East and West, we open our hearts to you. We pray that your grace flow through us. That we awaken to your light and love. And that we let it take us. Wherever our karma leads us. With you with us. We are successful. No matter what we do outwardly. Let us cling to thee inwardly. Until thy joy comes to us as bliss. Om. Peace. Amen. Go out with joy. Joy, joy, joy. you to our very special shopping afternoon. Today we're having all kinds of uh, snacks and sales and specials and toys at the thrift store in Shoreline, which is about 10 minutes from here. And uh, it all goes to support the Living Wisdom School. So we're uh, looking forward to seeing you all here. And he's really looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> he's been a little sad, so he wants to come back. <laughs> I, <laughs> Excuse us. Sure. I think that's all the announcement we need. We'll see you all at the thrift store. Uh, it's going to be a waste of time. 